In many situations in nature, males and females of the species are very much uh, of different size. Uh, most, uh, and it really all depends on the, on the species. Uh, most males are, are larger than most females, and the reason is because the males have to battle for reproductive rights. They have to battle their other males for reproductive rights. Uh, so if we look at gorillas, uh, the, great, the, the great gorillas of, um, of where is it? Nigeria? Not Nigeria. Niger. Um, we see uh, the silverback, the famous silverback. Uh, the, the male is like twice as large as the female. Uh, most humans, uh, females are smaller than, than most human males. It's not always the case, of course. I'm only five foot six. And I've been married three times, and my tallest wife was five foot four. But I mean, there's, there's, we have students that are much taller than I am, much larger than I am. Okay. So it really all depends. Where was I? The other day, I was at Walmart? And I saw this lady, and she was so big. I mean, she was like 6'2", 6'3". And I was thinking, where do you find a mate? <laughs> I know, the basketball team. We always play volleyball with people that are five, like in Phoenix, or in Tucson. They're so tall, and it's fun, though. <laughs> oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> they are good. <clears throat> anyway, uh, another definition of sexual dimorphism is the, the, that the male gamete is abundant, it's small, and it's cheap. So uh, males will produce millions and millions of sperm a day, um, actually millions and millions of sperm a minute. <clears throat> and uh, when they ejaculate, they eject tens of millions of sperm. Female gamete is large, rare, and expensive. Uh, so if we are looking at males and females, the female is worth a lot, a hell of a lot more than the male is. Males are cheap, females are, are expensive. Yeah, well, I mean, it takes nine months to, to produce a baby. It takes, what, 15 seconds to ejaculate. So I told you about the, the monkeys in, in Frankfurt. I was, <laughs> I was at the zoo, and this, this male monkey was walking around, and every time a female came around, he grabbed a hold of her, and he, and he had an erect penis. And he pumped her a couple times, threw her off. He was all finished. He, he'd done his duty. Uh, and he, he impregnated, well, he had intercourse with all the, all the female monkeys. Uh, but it, it took him all of, you know, five, ten seconds to get done, to finish up, <laughs> to do his duty. I don't know what you want to call it. And the Germans just thought it was the funniest thing they ever saw. This is in Frankfurt, Germany. <clears throat> so they're calling their friends up, and by the time, by the, and he and he just went around, and he must have uh, uh, had intercourse with all the females you know, five or six times. He was having a great time while well, somebody was, and the, of course <laughs> nobody had a, a smile on their face. It's not like he's you know has this great big smile on his face, it's like he's all grouchy or something. And the females are just kind of walking around looking for him. <clears throat> But when they got ready, they just kind of wandered past him, and he grabbed a hold of them, pumped them a couple times, and he was finished. Anyway, so the male gamete, of course, is, is abundant, small, and cheap. How many sperm did he produce? Uh, how many sperm did he utilize that day? Probably uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, perhaps. And that's the same in all mammals? Yeah, yeah, all mammals. Uh, now the interesting thing is, uh, we, and we've looked at this, uh, the difference, we're, we're, we try to figure out where humans fit. <clears throat> so we've got chimpanzees, we've got gorillas, and we've got, uh, and we've got humans. And if you look at, at uh, uh, gorillas, gorillas uh, maintain harems, uh, they have a relatively small penis, uh, they have a relatively small testicles, uh, they don't produce nearly as many uh, sperm as, as humans or chimpanzees, uh, but it's because they have exclusive rights to, all, to their entire harem. So they don't have to worry about producing a lot of sperm in order to impregnate somebody. The chimpanzee, on the other hand, if you've ever, well, of course, you've never watched chimpanzees breed, <laughs> but if, if you watch chimpanzees breed, what will happen is a female will come into heat and uh, her favorite uh, male 
will will have uh, exclusive rights to her initially, mm -hmm. but as soon as he's finished, then the number two male gets to have sex with her. Uh, it's it's really kind of fascinating because the males will line up. I mean, it's like she's a prostitute or something. They'll mm -hmm. they'll line up and wait wait their turn. Uh, if you look at a chimpanzee, their penis is relatively large. They have huge testicles. They create just masses of sperm because the, the one with the most sperm is the one that's going to impregnate the female. <clears throat> as fascinating as that is. So where are humans? Are we gorillas or are we chimpanzees? Well, the reality is we're somewhere in between because our testicles aren't nearly as large as, as chimpanzees, our penises aren't nearly as long as chimpanzees' penises are, uh, and our reproductive strategies are, are a little are different. It's most more monogamy than anything else, as curious as that is. So, as, as curious as that is. So, let's talk <laughs> about J-Lo. <laughs> Because of low cost of producing sperm, males can easily gather enough nutrients and energy to impregnate millions of women if they could find a million women that wanted to have sex with them, of course. All of this has to do with culture, it all has to do with society. Um, uh, Wilson talks about uh, uh, arranged marriages, which is what used to happen uh, all over the, the Navajo Nation. Uh, this seems to be the traditional way of doing things. Um, so I'm sorry? And in some countries, India, right. uh, Middle East. Right. And sometimes they'll marry at a really, really young I age. I think some, some parts of Ireland still do it too. Yeah. In England. Yeah. This is their royalty. It's really they they keep their bloodline. Yeah, they already know. Or they used to. I guess they don't anymore. For their males, and that's one of the reasons why Meghan Markle was such a was such a uh, slap in the face to, to the English. Because first of all, she's a, she's American, and second of all, she's not white. She has mixed ancestry, <clears throat> and so people were just really appalled, or some people. Really appalled. Everybody else is going. Oh, that's it. Okay. Who? That's kind of cool. You know. That's what I'm saying. Everybody I didn't have a problem with them. I love. Yeah. But you're not. You're not <laughs> Brit. You're not a Brit. <laughs> Whether males are selective or not, the odds are that they will have some offspring that survive. Uh, they can. Well, we're talking about the male that's just impregnating anybody that comes along, uh, that, or has intercourse with anybody that comes along. Uh, some of his offspring will survive, even though he's not there to protect them. Uh, females, on the other hand, have to be more selective, of course. Uh, it takes her nine months to, uh, to produce a child. It takes him, like I said before, 15 seconds. Um, he can impregnate any number of women in any given day, if he can find that many women that want to have sex with him. Uh, there was a basketball player uh, who had sex with women every chance he got, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, uh, and he is said to have had sex with over 10,000 women. Now the question is, how many children does he have? And, and No one has ever talked about how many women he actually impregnated, but uh, he certainly had sex with a lot of different women. <clears throat> and you can do that, I guess, if, if you can find the women that are willing to do that. Uh, once upon a time, J Lo dated Ben Affleck. It looked like they were going to get married at some point. Uh, this is after P Diddy. Okay, anyway, <laughs> they didn't get married. <laughs> Females that carefully nurture their costly eggs are more likely to have offspring that survive to uh, uh, to be the next generation. Thus, females must mate carefully. They they have to be very selective as to who they choose to uh, to uh, mate with. Uh, intercourse can mean impregnation, so she has to be very, very careful uh, with who she uh, has intercourse with uh, to the point of, of, of impregnation. Males that carry many beneficial genes are more likely to provide the female's offspring with favorable genes. But how does a woman do this? Uh, how does she do it? Uh, the female must, uh, must cost, uh, closely observe the appearance and behavior of the male. 
A vigorous, healthy male is more likely to carry good genes than an unhealthy one. Thus, courtship is a period when the female assesses the genetic makeup of a male to judge the suitability as a mate. Okay, so J-Lo has had children. She has a set of twins with this guy. I think that's Ricky Martin. Maybe I'm wrong. Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony. Okay, I can't. I get. I get all these these Puerto Rican singers mixed up. Ricky Mark, Martin is gay. He, he is gay. <laughs> yeah. he, he's by. He has a he's, husband and yeah, well, kids. Does <laughs> both. Oh, I. Uh, my cousin is a big fan. Big fan. Well, so the question is. Why did she choose him to have babies, to have uh, um, her children with? Um, because the confusing thing is, he's all dressed up. Uh, the confusing thing is that uh, if, if he didn't have the attributes that she was looking for, why, why would she make, make children with him? But she did. She made children with him. She didn't make children with this guy. I don't even remember what his name was. Uh, or with P. Diddy, which was her first boyfriend, or she never married him, but she lived with him, and she made a, a big splash when she wore that outfit that was cut all the way down to her pubic bone, as confusing as that is. <clears throat> anyway, so she's very selective, and she's made all kinds of interesting commercials. She used to, to advertise the... Uh, uh, what is it? Fiat 500. And she danced and they pulled her out of the car. I don't know. Anyway, J-Lo, very popular. And now, of course, she's with A-Rod. Uh, she's probably a little old to have children, I'm guessing. So A-Rod is just a boyfriend. I don't think she's probably going to have any more kids, but I, I may be wrong. You just never know. So lots of boyfriends, and she was very, she has been very selective. Um, she may be considered the, the quintessential female in the United States, since so she has had so many boyfriends. Uh, she's made lots and lots of movies. She's considered very attractive by some people, by, by a lot of different people. She's a modern day Liz Taylor. I'm sorry? She's like Liz Taylor. Oh, there you go. Liz Taylor, exactly. Anyway, so she's, she's an iconic figure, obviously. And it's interesting to watch, uh, to see uh, who she has selected uh, to be her mate. Uh, there are four mating strategies that are used in the animal kingdom to, be, uh, to ensure offspring survival. The first one is promiscuity. Uh, females will mate with more than one male or as many as they can uh, in any mating season. This is the way dogs do it. This is the way cats do it. Uh, they're looking for the best semen. They're looking for the best sperm. They're trying to find the most, the, the strongest, and, and the one that is most likely to survive. This will ensure that the male with the most attributes going for him is more likely to be the sire of her offspring. Uh, and this is the way, <clears throat> this is the way uh, a lot of animals do it. Uh, this is the way the birds do it. This is the way. Uh, cows do it. Uh, the, the biggest and baddest bull is the one that gets to breed uh, with almost all of the, uh, with all the uh, cows. <clears throat> she doesn't really select him. He sel the, the males select who is going to be the one that gets to, to breed. That's the same way with elk. It's the same way with deer. It's the same way with, uh, with birds, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, where I live, there are a lot of red-winged blackbirds, red-winged blackbird, and what the male will do, he will build a nest and he will start singing. Uh, and the, his song will bring in the females, and the better his song is, the more likely he will be the one that gets to breed. But sometimes, <clears throat> uh, despite the fact that he has created a, uh, a nest, sometimes what will happen is another, another male bird will breed with that female, and then she will nest in his nest. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of a dirty deal. It's like, that's, kind of, yeah, it's, that's not right. Oh, uh, polygamy, uh, also known as polygamy, is where the male uh, maintains a harem of females that he will 
have exclusively, uh, who he will exclusively mate with. Most ungulates mate in this fashion, as do gorillas and elephant seals. Uh, lions will do the same thing. Uh, this is also practiced among humans in many parts of the world, the Middle East, uh, India, to, uh, to some extent. <clears throat> uh, Here. The males can maintain more than one, more than one wife if they can afford them. Uh, normally, they won't have more. Or Africa is another area. Uh, I had a friend that, or a student. I'm sorry. Well, she's she was a friend of mine, but she was also a student. Uh, she went to Africa for. Um, was one of the relief programs. Anyway, while she was she was blonde, blonde and the palest lady you ever saw. She's white as that that wall. Uh, but she was blonde, and she went over there, and evidently she caught the eye of one of the males, uh, of a male. Uh, this was in uh, South Sudan, and he decided that he wanted to marry her. And so he started courting her, which was kind of funny, because she's a Christian and he's a Muslim. You know, I mean, all kinds of stupid stuff. Uh, he's, you know, he's in his 40s and she's uh, 19 or 20, whatever. Uh, a perfect age to be, to be a, a, a new bride. Anyway, so he told her that uh, in his culture, uh, the males tell the women that they're going to marry them. That's, that's the way it works. Uh, so he told her that uh, if her parents would come over to Africa and get their cattle, then, then they could be married, is what, he's, he, is what he said. So, uh, but he's already got three wives, so she would be her, his fourth wife, as curious as that is. Anyway, the, her parents never went over there to get <laughs> no. So they're not, they're not married. <laughs> As much fun as it is. And she said, half of his teeth were missing. <clears throat> One of our translators, uh, he had four wives. Oh, there you go. Um, Twelve kids. Oh, wow. And I was like, how do you afford? He goes, the cost of money, like if, if you go $20 to Afghanistan, right. like, you can fucking pretty much run the damn country. Right. So, I mean. Uh, he was a translator. You guys were paying him. Yeah, so, so he, he could afford it. So you're the one that financed all of his children. Good job. That's Twelve kids. Man. Twelve kids. Yeah. <laughs> all right. A lot of times uh, uh, people think, well, uh, look at all the promiscuity that's going on in these countries. Well, the reality is that it, it, they're very uh, conservative. And the reason they're conservative is because when a, they can only have sex with women at a certain time. Uh, during the month. Uh, so if she's in a period, they can't have sex. If she's pregnant, they can't have sex. And this is the reason they have more than one wife, so that... In, in Iraq, I, I was kind of astounded by this, but over there, the men are for pleasure. The women are just freaked, that's it. Yeah. They kind of like threw me off. I have like, okay, a wife. But that's it. That's the way. That's the way the world mm -hmm. works. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting. Um, in the Jewish religion, the Jew Jewish men cannot have sex with their wives um, a certain number of days before their period starts and a certain number of days afterwards. Now, of course, in the Jewish faith, they don't they don't have multiple marriages, but uh, they they still have these strictures as to when you can have sex with somebody and when you can't. As interesting as that is. <coughs> So that's polygamy. It's and that, that's like just their religion, right? Yeah, yeah, their religion dictates that. Okay. I mean, their religion also dictates that they can only eat select meats. They can't eat, uh, it has to be kosher, of course. Yeah. Uh, but they can't eat, um, uh, they can't eat pork. Uh, Muslims can't eat pork either. <clears throat> But well, there's a reason for that, and, and if you think about it, there's a, there's a logical reason. Uh, pigs have a, almost an identical immune system to humans. Uh, so pigs are the ones that, uh, that breed dis our diseases. So if you eat pork, you're more likely to come up with these diseases. Uh, I'll take the chance, I love bacon. You love bacon? I love bacon. <laughs> I eat uh, three packs myself. 
Under load. Ah, well, there you go. You're a good pork eater. There, there you go. And the people of Iowa and Indiana and Illinois appreciate your eating their, their uh, produce. They, they really enjoy that. Anyway, so, yeah, some people eat mutton, some people eat mm. pork. Polyandry is, is rarer than polygamy, but it's still known to occur. Uh, this is practiced in Tibet, where a woman will marry brothers. Uh, this is the woman here. This is, these are the two brothers. Uh, she has sex with both of them, but they're only allowed to, to have sex with her, as interesting as that is. Uh, usually it's brothers that they marry. Uh, that way, it all stays in the family. Same way with, actually it's the same way with polygyny. Uh, they marry sisters. A lot of times they'll marry sisters. Because sisters are more likely to get along than, than strangers, I guess. Uh, anyway, that's usually the way it works. Uh, monogamy is the most prevalent mating method among humans. Uh, and monogamy, a pair will, will form a mating pair uh, where exclusive access is maintained between both the male and the female. Uh, this seems to be the uh, best manner in which a woman can gain resources from her mate uh, when he must provide for his children, of course, to ensure that they survive. Uh, so he has to take care of his babies uh, because uh, well, there's only one of him and one of her. So that's the way it works. Sexual selection takes place when the female selects the male that, uh, that they wish to mate with. Uh, sexual selection among the birds is the most garish of all creatures. Uh, in order to attract a female, a male will weigh themselves down with impossible structures, such as the peacock's tail. Uh, the peacock's tail is not there for any other reason other than attracting female, uh, female pe peahens. I, I saw that in the zoo, they make like a weird noise and then they... Yeah, exactly. It is, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's weird because if you've ever been around peacocks, they scream like little kids. It sounds like they're little kids. It's like a screech. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> Some species participate in intricate mating rituals during courting uh, that are not only garish but call attention to themselves from predators. This is a um, prairie chicken. That's what this is. So if you go up north uh, to a powwow and they and they dance, they do the the chicken dance. Okay, it's it's actually the uh, prairie chicken is what they're they're the way they're dancing. Um, <clears throat> grass dancers uh, will dress like prairie chickens. Okay, of course, all the, almost all the prairie chickens are gone, so <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Almost all male birds have intricate songs that they sing in the spring during mating to attract a female. In some species, courting is extensive. Uh, strangely, among large cats, especially cheetah, uh, only vigorous exercise over several days will bring the female to ovulation. So what happens with cheetah, uh, you get uh, two brothers will, will chase a female, and they'll take turns chasing her. They, they can't let her stop. If she stops, then she won't ovulate. Uh, so the males, uh, the, the two males will chase her extensively over, over a couple days and then she ovulates and then, then uh, they both will breed with her and one of them will be the, uh, the father of the offspring. That's the way it works in the cheetah world. As weird as that is. These are the Wadabi of, of, uh, of Niger. These are the males, they're not the females. I'll show you what the females look like. These are Wadabi females. So as you can see, they're not nearly as made up as the males. These are Maasai females. So the, the males put all the fake stuff on? The makeup? Yeah, the, 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 it's the males that put all the makeup on, as you can see. Uh, but not only that, uh, it has to do with the movement of their eyes as well. Uh, they're trying to charm the women with their, with their clothes. They'll spend all of the money that they make in a year on... Uh, on outfits and, and makeup. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. Everybody uh, that live around the Wadabi hate them. The Wadabi consider themselves the most beautiful people in the world. I'm going to show you a film. I, if, I, I think I'm wrong. Right? There we go. Okay. The, 
What, what they're saying isn't as important. Oh, you're not getting it, are you? Okay. Forget it. All right. Anyway, this is really fascinating, the Wadabi. Um, <clears throat> the Wadabi males, they'll have a, a gathering, and the, the males will, will stand on one side, rolling their eyes and, and, and trying to attract the women with their, uh, with their odd facial expressions. And uh, <clears throat> the females will stand over there and act like they don't care. And then they'll just kind of pair up, as weird as that is. The Maasai are a little bit different. The Maasai uh, live in the same area. Well, actually, they live farther south. Uh, but the Maasai, um, the, the males will attract the females by uh, jumping. Uh, the idea is that when they're looking for predators, uh, they, they're, they're herdsmen. Uh, the, actually, both groups are herdsmen. The Wadabi herd sheep, and the Maasai herd uh, cows. Uh, so the Maasai will jump up and down uh, when they are looking for predators, lions specifically. Uh, they uh, that's how they that's how they spot them by jumping up and down. So the the male that uh, jumps the highest is considered the most attractive or the most likely to be a good, good provider because he's able to keep his his cows from being murdered by by lions as weird as it is anyway the Maasai and the Wadabi as you can see the Wadabi attract women with their beauty and the Maasai attract women with their their basketball playing ability or their <laughs> jumping actually they're jumping up. and they'll just bounce up and down uh, and uh, the, the women, of course, will giggle every time. Where are they? At? Where are they? Yeah. Um, the Maasai are in Kenya, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in that area. And the Wadabi are, are in uh, just below the uh, Sahara Desert. Like I said, the, the people that, uh, all, the, all their neighboring tribes, they're actually Fulani, um, is, which is a, a, a group. It's kind of like Athabascan. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's not really a language group. Well, yeah, it is a language group. Uh, but uh, they, they look different. I mean, the Fulani that you find in, in, on the Ivory Coast look different than the, the uh, Fulani that you find in Ni Nigeria. Uh, but these guys are Fulani. And as you can see, they, they're very, very attractive. <laughs> and they consider themselves the most attractive people in the world, uh, for some reason. All right. But it isn't the uh, women that uh, are the most attractive. It's the males, as weird as that is. But <clears throat> you can see they look very, very much different. Uh, the females shave their heads. Uh, these females will have. Uh, will grow interesting uh, hairstyles. They have more interesting hairstyles. Uh, the funny thing about the Fulani women is, uh, not the Fulani women, but the Wadabi women, they don't ever smile. They don't smile. You saw what the men look like. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They got big grins on their faces. The women never smile. It's really kind of funny. As compared to the Maasai women, these, these ladies have a smile on their face almost all the time. As just the way the world works. <laughs> Sexual differentiation takes place among most humans while still in the womb. But we uh, decide we're going to be boys or girls, or uh, our bodies decide we're going to be either boys or girls uh, in, the, in the womb. The sperm either carries a male or female chromosome. All ova are female. If it was up to women, then all babies would be female. Uh, the uh, the uh, ova all are always X. They're either X or O, which means there's, they don't have any genes at all, any sex genes. This, this happens, uh, but it's, it, it's really kind of interesting because we'll, we'll see later that sometimes if there's an open gene, uh, then, uh, then it, it causes all kinds of interesting problems for the, uh, for the female. Thus, males are a heterogametic uh, sex because of the two different chromosomes. It's either an X or a Y. 
so when a baby is born, if it's a boy, it's the man's fault. If it's a girl, it's the man's fault because it's always the sperm that decides the gender of the, of the child. While well, females are, are homogametic, uh, they always are exes. Uh, very early in development, the gonads are not differentiated. Uh, this is uh, in different uh, gonads uh, when the, the, the fetus is first uh, developing. It's neither a male or a female. We don't know yet, uh, and it won't uh, develop until about the sixth week. In mammals, the Y chromosome contains an SRY gene uh, that is responsible for the development of the testes. Uh, the testes will determine whether it's going to be a male or a female. Uh, if they develop testes, it's going to be a male. If they don't develop testes, and the reason that the testes make somebody a male is because of the excessive testosterone that the testes produce. If the individual has a Y chromosome, the uh, cells of the in indifferent gonads begin uh, making SRY protein. The SRY protein will then create the testes, and the testes will, will make the testosterone, and so the, uh, the uh, uh, fetus will be bathed in testosterone and will become a male. The SRY protein causes the core of the cells to proliferate over the outer layer of the cells and the gonad become testes, and at that point they start producing testosterone. And that's what a male looks like, I just, in case you guys are just curious. Uh, what's SRY gene? SRY protein. Protein, what is that? It's, uh, it's the protein that, in, that, uh, that makes the, that creates the testes. So, S what does that stand for? SRY, does it stand for anything? No. I don't think so. Oh. Look it up. I'm yeah. not exactly sure. That's what a guy looks like. <laughs> Just in case you guys didn't know what males look like. It's it, well, well, maybe. No. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, he's, he's obviously a bodybuilder. And this is what a female looks like, if you're just curious. I know, I know you're curious as to the difference between males and females. That's what a woman looks like. Yeah, looks <laughs> like maybe. <laughs> yes. I think she's probably got a deep voice. We know she's a girl, a uh, female, because you can see her brassiere barely. There we go. Okay. Is that muscle? <laughs> no, that's she's. You can see her her bra underneath her her outfit. She does look awfully masculine, though, doesn't she? Yeah, this good. <laughs> if the individual has no Y chromosome. Uh, no SRY protein is produced, and the indifferent uh, gonads form with the outer layer dominant, and the inner core is inhibited. Uh, so it has to do with the SRY protein. SRY protein, if they have the protein, it's a male. If they don't have the protein, it becomes a female. <clears throat> As the fetus begins to form, they develop two ducts that connect the indifferent gonads to the cell wall. There's the Wolfian duct and the Mullerian duct. Duct. Looks like duct tape. Uh, if bathed in testosterone from the testes, the Wolfian duct will develop. If not, the Mullerian duct will develop. So this is how we become boys or girls. Uh, we are either bathed in testosterone and uh, we develop Wolfian ducts, or we are uh, we don't have the uh, the testosterone and the Wolfian duct will go away and the Mullerian duct will, will develop. If the SRY protein is released by the Y chromosome, the gonads become testes and they bathe the area in testosterone, as I keep saying. The Wolfian duct develops into the vas deferens, the epididymis, uh, the, and the seminal vesicle, the Mullerian duct will disappear. Uh, the genital tu tubercle uh, becomes a penis and the genital fold becomes a scrotum. So there you go. All the parts, all the parts of boys and girls are the same, except for the Mullerian duct and the Wolfian duct. Everything else is the same. If both the chromosomes are X's, the gonads become ovaries. The Mullerian duct develops into the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the inner vagina, and the Wolfian duct will disappear. The genital tubercle becomes a clitoris, and the genital fold becomes the labia majora labia majora and labia minora. So you can see how close all of these parts are. They develop from exactly the same cells. The difference is testosterone. That's it. The SRY protein uh, will 
create testes, and the testes will bathe the area in, uh, in uh, testosterone and create the male um, uh, reproductive system. If, it, if the SRY protein isn't there, then the, uh, the Wolfian duct will disappear. Mullerian duct will, will uh, create all of these other structures. But all the structures come from the same source. As interesting as all that is. Now you can see how this might get screwed up. If they have testosterone and then, they, and then the testosterone decreases, uh, then potentially what they will do is they will develop both, both body parts, as weird as that is. When I was in the service, we had a guy that uh, was wounded in Vietnam, and, uh, oh God, what a mess. This guy was the hairiest guy you ever saw. <laughs> Not that that was, a, well, it, 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 it is important. There's a reason why he had all that hair. And we had no clue what was going on. So he comes in. Uh, he'd been wounded. At, he had an abdominal wound in Vietnam. Um, he had a leg wound. He was a pilot. Uh, so that's why we got him uh, at, the, uh, at the hospital, because he was a pilot. He was an Air Force pilot. So he came in, and, and we started working on him. Um, uh, they, uh, he had a leg wound. Uh, and, it, and it got infected, and we couldn't get it to stop. We, we, we kept treating him with stuff. We kept treating him with antibiotics, and it wouldn't heal. It was just the nuttiest thing in the whole wide world. Well, it turned out that this guy was the horniest guy you ever met. I mean, he would not leave the nurses alone. We had to assign male nurses to, to take care of him because he would not. He just kept grabbing them. He, he was just a horn dog. He's <laughs> just a really bad guy. So, um, uh, <laughs> so they finally figured out what was going on. Uh, he had, uh, from Vietnam, they had shipped him to uh, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. And while he was in the Philippines, because he's such a horn dog, he, he went out on the, and, and got an infection in his leg. It was a, it was a, it was a venereal infection. And of course, when you're looking at somebody's leg, you're not thinking, you know, gonorrhea. It's not, it wasn't gonorrhea. And if it had been gonorrhea, we could have fixed it with, uh, with um, antibiotics. But what it was was um, uh, trichomonas. Trichomonas is, a, is a, an amoeba. Well, you don't run into trichomonas. It's a sexually transmitted infection. And he got it in his leg because uh, we won't go into how why uh, trichomonas was around his leg. But uh, anyway, he picked, he picked up trichomonas, and we couldn't, we couldn't treat it because we were trying to treat him with antibiotics. Eventually, we figured out what it was. Dang. I know, it's stupid, but it gets worse. <clears throat> it got worse, did you guys have to amputate? No, 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 no. Well, as soon as we figured out what it was, we treated him with flagell, and, and, and it took care of his infection. Uh, but then we, uh, he had a, an abdominal abscess uh, that we had to treat. So we went in there. It was, it was from a shrapnel wound. He had been hit by um, uh, an anti-aircraft fire. And that's why he had a leg wound. That's why he had an abdominal wound. Uh, so he came in, and, and of course we did surgery. And when they went in, what they found was <clears throat> that, uh, sure, he had testicles, but he also had ovaries. And what was happening, the ovaries were, were pumping out all those female hormones, and the testes were working overtime to produce enough testosterone to, uh, to counteract the, his ovaries. So this guy had both sexual parts. He was, he was a hermaphrodite. Uh, but the, his male parts had become dominant. And he grew lots and lots of hair because of his excessive testosterone. Uh, he was also balding, and that has something to do with it as well. Uh, yeah. So the question, well, the question was, what do we do? I mean, this guy's just all. He was hard to control. I mean, he was really bad. I'm surprised he was a captain. I'm surprised he hadn't been busted for uh, sexual assault. Oh, my God, he was rank, huh? he was terrible. Uh, we, for what they did initially, of course, we, most of our nurses were female, 
so the, the female nurses couldn't handle him. Uh, but then they, they had the older they had older officers coming in and trying to take care of him. Older female officers, majors and, and lieutenant colonels, trying to control this guy's behavior. And and he's grabbing them just like he was grabbing the, the younger nurses. He didn't care. He didn't well no, he he couldn't control it. That was the problem. I don't know how in the world he ever survived. Nobody had killed him. He would look like a bear, that's what they called him. That was his nickname. Bear. And, and he had hair everywhere. He was it was just a mess. So what did we do? Oh, so they had to decide whether what they were going to do, what whether they were going to cut out and whether they were going to tell him, that was the problem. We didn't know what it would do to him. Uh, so we had to decide whether we were going to take out his ovaries or not. He had a uterus as well. And he also had a vagina. Now, I, I don't know what he thought. Uh, he, it was right under his, his uh, testicles. Um, I don't know what he thought that opening was. I guess nothing was ever happening down there. But he had, it looked like he had two anuses. Uh, as weird as that is. But one of them was a vagina. So he had a vagina and he had, he had, uh, he had a testicle and penis, of course. He didn't have an, an extra cl clitoris. Uh, so we had to decide what we were going to do. Well, what would you do? Would you tell him? This guy who, I don't know. We had to decide what we were going to do. Yeah, I mean, you have to. We, do we have to tell him? Okay. Yeah. I think the same thing. Okay. We didn't. <laughs> no, we took it out and we didn't tell him. Uh, the interesting thing was we took it out. Uh, he was still with us uh, after a couple weeks. I mean, it was really kind of an interesting surgery. Uh, they took out his ovaries. They took out his, uh, his uterus. Uh, they didn't sew up his vagina, but it kind of closed up automatically anyway. <laughs> Uh, but we didn't tell him because we were afraid it would cause too much psychological damage to him. Um, he quieted down. It worked. Uh, it, uh, it, he couldn't get married. I mean, he wouldn't get married because he was just too wild. Uh, and uh, after that, you know, I saw him later on. He lost a lot of his hair, too. He was afraid. I don't know what he was afraid of. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, it was kind of interesting because he would come into the uh, hospital uh, and, and I'd have to dry his blood. And so I, I got to see him over a, a, a longer period of time. It's kind of a curious case. Um, yeah, the poor doctor was asking everybody. And of course, at the time, I was a two-striper, I think. But, uh, you know, I, I, I got in on the conversation. It was really kind of an interesting situation. Anyway, we, we cut out his his female parts and, and didn't tell him and, and, and everything worked out okay. What's a two stripper? I, I, I do not understand That's the Air Force ranks, man. They, they look all the same to me. Uh, he dis what, what? distinguishes the first surgeon. First strike. Was that senior airman? No. It, it is now. At that time we were, what were we? I can't remember. Yeah, they changed the, name, the names of all the ranks. Um, a three-striper used to be a sergeant, and then a four-striper was a staff sergeant. Uh, what was a two-striper? It wasn't a corporal. I guess they kind of incorporated both. Senior air, uh, senior airman. Yeah, senior airman. They were senior airmen. Yeah, the only three stripes is a sergeant. Yeah. When I got out, I had three up and two down. Okay, that was. What would have been a tech sergeant? sergeant. And and six. Uh, E7. 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 Okay. E1 was no stripes, uh, E2 was one stripe, mosquito wing. E3 was, yeah. And the Chevron and the Rocker, so, I mean for us, that'd be, uh, that's a probably first class. You don't get a Rocker in the Air Force until E6. Dang, that's it. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, so we got all these parts. <laughs> and he had all of them. He had everything going for him. Testosterone from the testes uh, releases a hormone called anti-Mullerian hormone that shrinks the Mullerian duct, and that's why the Mullerian duct goes away. If they don't produce this um, uh, anti-Mullerian hormone, then they've got both sexual parts. 
That's where hermaphrodites come from. This causes a tissue around the urethra to form a prostate gland. Uh, a lot of times hermaphrodites are sterile. Uh, usually they're sterile because they've got, they actually don't have a prostate gland. Uh, this causes the epithelial tissue around the urethra to form a scrotum and penis. Uh, of course, those do, do uh, form with, uh, with somebody who is a hermaphrodite. The epithelial cells have 5 alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which allows masculinization. So it's this stuff, the 5 alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, that creates, makes males males. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, he had that because he was kind of a hyper male. He was, he was a mess. Uh, you think, oh, he's just a tough guy. I, I'll tell you what, it was irritating. It was really, really irritating. We couldn't send, we had to, um, all females had to be chaperoned. And he was, he was a, not a very nice person. So if, uh, if I went in with, with a female nurse, uh, he would order me out of the room, he would yell at me, he would scream at me, you know, you know he'd swear at me, all kinds of horrible stuff would happen if I went in with the, with the nurse just to protect her. <clears throat> and of course we were ordered by the doctor not to let him molest the females or, or mess with the females. So despite the fact he's screaming, you know, giving all these military orders. Even though he has the rank, you still got to listen to... We listened to the doctor the because the doctor was a major and he was a captain. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it got a little... A little dicey from time to time. Yeah, it's, 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 it's only, yeah, it's only one reason. But he wanted to beat everybody up too. I mean, he was a kind of a violent fella. So I mean, he grabbed me a couple times uh, and, and threatened to, to punch me. But he threatened everybody. It wasn't just me. Ah, huh, there we go, Linda Hunt. Uh, if the sperm or the ova do, do not have a sex chromosome, the individual will have only one X chromosome. Uh, this individual has Turner syndrome and will be a female uh, with uh, short stature and not develop secondary sexual characteristics. That's Linda Hunt. Uh, Linda Hunt's first major movie was The Year of Living Dangerously, where she played a male. Uh, as interesting as that is. She's, she's a good actor. Is she on one of the crime shows? Yeah, she's on NCIS Los Angeles. Yeah, she's yeah. good. She's good at yeah, she's like this tall. Yeah, she's, she's like not. the genius of the group, huh? Or she's the one who puts everything together. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. <laughs> she doesn't have. She doesn't have. Uh, sex isn't isn't trying to pull her. Uh, you know, trying to trying to uh, uh, in, invade her mind uh, because she doesn't have any sex drive. She has Turner syndrome. Uh, this is what Turner syndrome looks like. These are two sisters. Uh, this one does not have Turner syndrome. Obviously, this one does. Uh, these these two are, are sisters, and as you can see, the one with Turner syndrome looks like a little girl. Linda Hunt still looks like a little girl. Of course, she's in her her sixties. Yeah. But anyway, that she has Turner syndrome. Uh, if the female fetus is exposed to androgens in the uterus, she might develop congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The overactive adrenal glands will uh, produce more androgen and cause genitalia that appears as either an uh, undersized penis or an oversized clitoris. And of course the labia kind of look like uh, testicles. Uh, so it almost looks like she's a female, but she, I mean, she's a male, but she's not. She's a female, oops, I'm sorry. No, that was right. Uh, since the androgen receptor is on the X chromosome, if an XY individual has a defective androgen receptor, they will not be sensitive to androgenic hormones. Um, when I was in the service, we had a, my neighbor uh, had a baby and uh, they had uh, adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, but in her case, she had no labia. Her labia were missing. It was a, it was a genetic defect. So she had no labia. Uh, she just had a clitoris. Uh, I was really kind of curious looking at, the, at her sexual parts, uh, like people are looking at babies' sexual parts. 
uh, because it looked like she had a penis, uh, but she had no labia. So she had, looked like she had a penis with no testicles. Uh, and she did have a, a, distended, um, a distended clitoris. Uh, I didn't see her in the hospital. I saw her, my neighbor. It was weird. <laughs> this, was, this was a first for me. They, come, they called us to the, to the house, uh, to their house. They were, she was going to breastfeed for the first time. And evidently, in whatever culture they were from, they, that this was something that you, everybody got to see, the baby breastfeed. It's a little weird for me. I had never watched somebody else's wife having breastfeeding their baby. It was a little odd. I just thought it was strange. <clears throat> in my culture, of course, you don't go around exposing your nipples to everybody, but that's exactly what happened in this case. It's really kind of, kind of interesting. They were Lebanese? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, since the androgen receptors on the X chromosome, if an XY individual has a defective androgen receptor, they will not be sensitive to androgenic uh, hormones. Uh, these individuals are referred to as androgen insensitive. These individuals will develop external female genitalia and develop all the secondary female sexual characteristics except for menarche and have, they will have a shallow vagina. Uh, but they look like they're female. Uh, that's, yeah, so that's what happened. Uh, these are individuals that look like they're female. They have secondary sexual characteristics. This is a younger individual. As you can see, they have uh, uh, their, their pubic hair is, grows in a uh, female fashion. Uh, but the reality is, if you look at their genes, they're male. And that's what happened with this individual. This individual uh, ran for South Africa. Uh, <clears throat> she ran for South Africa, uh, or he ran for South Africa, actually. Uh, she ran as a female because she had it looked like she was a female. But if you, when they checked her, uh, her genes, uh, they checked her DNA, they found out she was a male. And that's why she... Her musculature looks male, and her sexual parts look just like this. Uh, they just don't ever develop penises and testicles because she's androgen uh, insensitive. As weird as that is. Guavadoches, uh, guavadoches means uh, eggs at 12 is what it means. Uh, there are a group of males in the Dominican Republic whose five alpha reductase converts testosterone, which converts testosterone to dehydrotestosterone, uh, which, will, which allows the penis and the scrotum to grow, is mutated. Despite the fact that the individual has an, an uh, XY chromosomal structure, uh, the lack of five alpha reductase does not form a penis. Uh, the area that looks this area will look like a vagina, but it has no vaginal opening. As you can see, this is what this is a four-year-old with uh, with this problem. As you can see, it looks like a female, and they raise them as a female. As weird as this is, uh, because they do do have testes with puberty, their bodies are bathed in testosterone, and their penis develops. Uh, their hips narrow, and their build uh, turns uh, obviously masculine, as in this case. This individual is 42 years old, is, and he, as you can see, he looks masculine. These individuals uh, who were raised and acted like females suddenly begin looking and acting like males. Uh, most will become males, uh, but they have a choice, of course. They can either become males or not, or not become males. This is the same child, 4 years old, 6 years old, 12 years old. There's 18 months, and here he is at 19. He has become a male. Uh, but he didn't become a male until age 12 when his, uh, uh, when his uh, five alpha reductase, when he went through puberty and he developed a uh, penis and scrotum, which bathed his system in uh, uh, testosterone. But he doesn't have to. Uh, here's a case of an individual that uh, uh, decided that she would, I don't that she would become a uh, female, where she acted like a female. And as you can see, she has breast tissue, but she also has uh, the male genitalia. And here's another one. <clears throat> uh, an 
individual that uh, chose to be a female. Now, of course, we can do surgery and we can change them in, into either, either gender that they want to be. Uh, but here's, here's an individual that decided that she wanted to stay a female. Here's an individual, this one, this guy right here, this individual right here, uh, was raised as a female until he was, uh, went through puberty and then he became a male. And there he is as a male. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, the Dominican Republic. Why it's on that, uh, that, that half of the island, of course, the Dominican Republic is uh, half the island is Haiti and the other half is the Dominican Republic. Why it's there, we're not exactly sure, but it's a, it's a mutated gene that we only find uh, on that island, as weird as that is. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> ah, sorry about the strange stories. Ah. <clears throat> Working in medicine, you get to see lots of interesting things. But then it, it also gives you a better understanding of what you're teaching us to. Like, I, oh, yeah. It, I, I understand it more clearly when there's a story behind it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's why I tell the stories. If you've never been through this stuff, you don't really, I mean, you can read it, but it, it just kind of goes over your head. You don't really understand it. Yeah. But I, I get to see it. Bear, oh, he was such a pain in the ass. Oh. Uh, my entire time in the service, 12 years, I was in the service for 12 years, and he's the only guy that punched me, the only officer that punched me the whole time I was in the service. I was grabbed by officers. I was jerked around by officers because they're jerks. I'm good. I got hurt once by an officer. Uh, you know, they have like the pins in their hat for your rank, right? Yeah. Well, I literally had to take a screwdriver. He pinned it to my forehead. Oh my god. And I just. You probably still have the scar. Uh, well, yeah, it was when I got my phone. Ah. He, he was a warrant officer. He's a warrant officer. Oh, that's like the same thing. He goes, well. Cause no, because I wanted him to promote me. Right. Because you got your choice. Right. You know? And my commander, he was an Apache pilot, so he goes, well, I can't do it. I'm fucking shit up in there. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to go, uh, my chief, chief one of the uh, better court. Okay. Oh, what an ass. No, that is cool. Yeah. That's not cool, having somebody embed a, a, your, your rank in your forehead. I don't think that's... Cool. You only get it once, unless you lose it, then you get it again. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so we're talking about homeostasis. Uh, and I keep talking about this, the reality is, and of course you see this in medicine all the time, uh, the human body wants to heal itself. And it will heal itself if you leave it alone, usually. But sometimes we accelerate the process uh, by giving you medication or if we think we're accelerating the process. Sometimes we're just causing you other problems okay, with, med with medicine. Because most medicines are toxin toxic, they're toxins. Uh, but the human body ha has to be in a, a, a state of balance. That's, and that's known as homeostasis. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with hojo. This is something totally different. An individual cannot live unless they can stay warm, and outside right now, it's cold out there. It's, it was minus 12 degrees and the wind was blowing at about 30 miles an hour. So it was really cold. Uh, and if you didn't uh, cover up and um, uh, make sure that you didn't have any exposed body parts, uh, potentially you froze, you could freeze part of your body. So you, the, the human body needs to stay warm. It also needs to be, uh, to find water. You've got to, and well, you don't have not today. Yeah, not today. I've got my lemonade, of course. Uh, talking, I'm, I'm expelling a lot of fluids, uh, so I have to, I have to drink uh, my, my lemonade from time to time. And of course, we have to feed ourselves, and this is something I think about every day. Uh, as I get older, I'm not as hungry as I used to be. Uh, I used to eat 
you know, I could sit down and eat lots and lots of food. Uh, but as I, as I got older, as I'm getting older, I, my appetite's not, as, not what it used to be. The body maintains an elaborate monitoring system to ensure that the individual is aware of their thirst, uh, whether they're warm enough, and, and, and uh, their hunger. Uh, my mother, when she was, I don't know, she was in her 40s or 50s, she read that uh, people live longer if they sleep in a cold bedroom. So what she did, and of course she's trying to keep my dad alive forever. She figured she could do that. <laughs> so she, she decides she's going to turn the heat off in, her, in their bedroom. Uh, so and what that did was that, and they opened the window. Uh, and then they broke the window, so uh, they couldn't close it. So, and, and this is Indiana, it's, it's cold in Indiana. Anyway, so the, she decides she's going to do this. Uh, so they put a lot of covers on the bed, uh, but they lived, my mom lived to, to 98, my dad was uh, 90 when he died. He had a heart condition, he had to have open heart surgery when he was in his 50s, uh, but he lived to be 90 years old. Part of that may have had something to do with the fact that they slept in a cold bedroom. Why they, is it? I'm sorry? Why is it? Um, well, there's, there's probably a bunch of reasons. One, they had to cuddle in order to stay warm. Um, now, I, you know, that's a lot of positive feelings going back and forth. Um, uh, it, the uh, most bacteria and viruses are fairly fastidious. Uh, they, need, uh, they need temperatures of, of 90.6. Yeah, and, and if you're in a cold environment, uh, then you're, uh, you're, breathing, uh, you're breathing cold air uh, on, a, on a continual basis. So it's very difficult for a cold virus or for any bacteria to take hold in your body. And my mother never, never was never sick. She just was never sick. Uh, my dad, too, which was kind of amazing because he had all kinds of interesting problems. Had psoriasis, he had heart, a heart condition, uh, but he was hardly ever sick. And it may have been because they slept in a cold bedroom. Uh, when all the flu viruses are wandering around and, and the cold viruses, it's the winter time. Uh, so if you can you know, ma maintain yourself. At that. Yeah, I, I, like, in my house we have the heater up, right? Sure. But I I can't stand it when it's fucking out. I'm not sure it's from my rag or whatever. Sure. But I have to have the fan on. She's over here freezing, I'm still freezing. I got the neck sweats and everything sure. else. So, um, it's weird. Yeah, yeah, it, it, but it has to do with sleeping because that's, that's when, uh, uh, most of your metabolism takes place during the night. Uh, if something's going to take hold, it usually takes hold at night. So you wake up with a cold or you wake up with the flu. Uh, usually when you go to bed, you don't have the flu and then you wake up with something. Just, you know, it's just the way it works. Um, uh, how do we know this? Uh, well, the, uh, the, in the Scandinavian countries, they don't heat their bedrooms. Uh, in Germany, they don't heat their bedrooms. Uh, so, and, we, and those are two very healthy uh, populations, the Germans and the, and the Scandinavians. So that's where it came from. That's where the whole idea came from. I have, yeah, I've, I have relatives that, uh, that uh, keep their bedroom at, you know, 72 degrees or whatever, 78 degrees, which is warm. Uh, my house is at 60 degrees. So, at my house. It's not because I'm cheap. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. It's just that I'd rather cover up if I'm cold. Exactly. Once you're hot, you're screwed. Yeah. You can't really do nothing. Then you're sweaty, and then, then if it gets exposed to the cold, now all of a sudden you've got, you've got the chills. Okay, so warmth is, is really important, and maybe sleeping in a cold room is a good idea. I work for my parents. Uh, my, my wife and I do that. Uh, our whole upstairs is heated because it's an old Victorian farmhouse. Uh, it is uh, so important to, to the body uh, that the body maintains several means of monitoring for each system. And this is known as redundancy. So we've got a, um, 
we've got heat uh, warmth detectors all over our bodies. We have uh, uh, water detectors all over our bodies, and we have uh, hunger detectors all over our bodies. Not just one system, we have multiple systems. And this is one of the reasons if you go on a diet that uh, sometimes um, you feel hungry and you're not exactly sure why you feel hungry. Well, it's probably part of the redundant system. If we could just, if we could, if there was only one system, we could uh, short circuit that system and then we, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have to worry about you being hungry. But it's almost impossible to do because there are so many different systems that are, are trying to determine whether you're hungry, whether you, you're thirsty, or whether you're warm or cold. Uh, the nervous system coordinates these regulatory systems. Uh, the brain uh, close, closely monitors temperature, water supply, and nutrient supply by using a variety of neural and hormonal mechanisms to keep them within the critical range. If we have an ex, uh, excess of, of any of the three, our bodies have ways of shedding the excess to maintain our level of homeostasis. This is usually done without our knowledge. We don't even think about it. Uh, this happened to me last night. Uh, I, I went home. Jeez, I have just the strangest. It's a good thing you didn't come into my office yesterday. <laughs> I had people in there all day long. Um, uh, one, of, one of my colleagues came in and, and, and needed to talk. Uh, we, I, I t Marius and I walked to the, to the uh, post office and I didn't understand what was going on. He, he's got something going on at home and he wanted to talk to me about it. Anyway, so I was just, it was kind of a mess. And so by the time I went home, I had been counseling all day long. I'd been counseling all day long, and I didn't even think about food. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about drinking. Usually I drink two of these things, two of these things every day, and I only drank one yesterday because I just didn't think about drinking. Uh, anyway, so I got home, and, and I'm, I'm trying to heat up the house, uh, you know, build a fire and whatnot. And then I, I realize, oh my god, I'm hungry. I'm really, really hungry. <laughs> So usually this is done without our knowledge. Uh, I, sh I probably should have eaten before that. I should have realized I was hungry. I should have drunk more than I did. <clears throat> Does this go lemonade make you dehydrated? Uh, no, no, it's lemon. Lemon's good for you. I mean, is it lemonade or is it like country time? Or no, no, no. Like it's it's I, it's got half a lemon in it. Oh, okay. So it's got the real stuff in it. Yeah, it's it's good for your for, for your hydration. Lemon is good for your hydration. That's why people put lemon in, in water, because it's good for your hydration. What was my point? Oh, what was one of the they did at restaurants? Lemon in water. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it, it um, helps your hydration, makes you feel less thirsty. Seeking either shelter, food, or water is, uh, is to seek a primary need. Uh, this type of behavior is known as motivated behavior. Um, if we're dealing with um, uh, refugees, that's what we need to make sure. We need to make sure that they have shelter, that they're covered, uh, that they have food so that they, they don't starve to death, and we need to make sure they have water. Now, water is not that big a deal in a lot of parts of the country, or a lot of parts of the world, because there is water everywhere. Uh, but in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, water is a really important thing. And of course, one of the, one of the things we had to think about when we invaded uh, Afghanistan, or when we invaded Iraq, uh, was uh, the water supply. We needed to make sure we had we had adequate water supply. Same thing happened. In, in Vietnam. Um, we couldn't drink their water because their water was contaminated. Now it's okay for them because they're used to the contamination. Their bodies are uh, accustomed to the, yeah. exactly, to the, uh, and this happens to, used to happen to people when they went down into Mexico. Uh, the Mexicans can drink, you know, they're used to that, that uh, food, that type of contamination. But when we went down there, when Americans went down to Mexico, uh, we'd get sick, we'd get dysentery, 
uh, because we couldn't fight off the bacteria. We weren't used to it. Our bodies weren't used to it. And that's pretty much what happened to Native, uh, Native Americans when uh, Europeans first came over here. They had all these strange diseases that had never been seen in this area. You had no immunity against it, and it killed, it killed off whole populations. To the extent that, uh, and we're not exactly sure how many people were here, um, but uh, it may have killed off 90 to 99% of the population. That's a point of fact. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so you got to get used to the stuff. So that's, you got to get used to the, the water in that area. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you guys had uh, purified your own water. You didn't drink from the, the well, uh, local water system. There's a company called, uh, the, well, in Iraq, it was KBR. Yeah. They would uh, bring pallets of water in. Mm -hmm. But once in a while, they get like a bad batch. And I'm like, man, forget it, man. So I'll get the Camelback. Uh, tablets. Right. Our uh, our chief one, the stuck one. <laughs> he he bought like like five hundred dollars worth of tablets and gave it to the unit. Oh, is that right? He would put this in your water. So. Okay. So it's supposed to purify the water. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked. It tasted mm -hmm. like. It it, it kind of tasted like alkazosa, uh, but yeah. After you let it calm down, you shake it up a little bit. It tastes like. Whatever water tastes like. All water has a flavor, as weird as that is, because it's all it's got minerals in it. Uh, if you drink uh, distilled water, which has no mineral, theoretically has no minerals in it. And this is uh, It doesn't taste good. Purified water, calcium chloride, and sodium bicarbonate. Yeah, there you go. It's, that's that's bubble water. Yeah, they're telling you what's in there. As cool as that is. Anyway. If you drink water that's been sitting for a long time, doesn't have any oxygen in it, uh, it tastes nasty, it tastes bad. Uh, of course, it also tastes like whatever the container that it's in. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we have motivated behavior. Uh, the systems used to regulate temperature fluid, uh, body fluids, and metabolism are negative feedback systems. Uh, negative feedback uh, has to do with uh, you don't have enough of this, so it tells you that you need more. That's a negative feedback system. Uh, it is like, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, anyway, it's a negative feedback system. When an individual goes beyond a set point uh, in the level for one of the primary needs, the brain is informed of the negative level, like a warning light on a gas gauge, and that tells you that you need, you need to drink. <clears throat> you may not feel thirsty, but uh, the, that's what happened to me last night. Um, I, I didn't think I was hungry. I didn't feel like I was hungry. But uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I knew that I was hungry and I needed to eat. So I had spaghetti. Old spaghetti. It was just it was from, from this week, past weekend I, I ate spaghetti. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll pick this up next time, as much fun as that is.